Good morning. A quorum uh, now being present the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, the hearing entitled Transnational Drug Enterprises, Threats to Global Stability and U.S. National Security from Southwest Asia, Latin America, and West Africa, will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that the, only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements, and without objection, that's so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee would be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. Without objection, that is so ordered. So today, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs turns its attention to a longstanding and growing threat to the United States national security and transnational illicit drug trade. Illicit drugs from Mexico, Latin America, and the Caribbean are no strangers to our shores. The issue of illicit drugs is also no stranger to this House and Congress. In March of this year, we held a hearing on money, guns, and drugs to examine whether U.S. inputs were fueling drug-related violence on the U.S.-Mexico border. This subcommittee has also held numerous hearings on Afghanistan, producer of 95 percent of the world's poppy crop that forms the basis of the heroin trade. Today's hearing builds on that record. It raises a central question about the relationship between the global illicit drug enterprises and their collective threat to our national security. The United States has had a geographic or country-specific drug control strategy ranging wildly, widely from the Balkan states of Eastern Europe to Colombia, Guatemala and Mexico, and more recently to West Africa. While each country's conditions dictate a unique drug control strategy, today's hearing examines some of the underlying trends and the related implications for United States national security. There is compelling evidence that illicit drugs create enormous financial power that allows traffickers to corrode government institutions. Bribes undermine confidence in the very institutions we rely on to protect us as corruption reaches judges, prosecutors, police, and correctional officers. When bribes fail, traffickers use ruthless violence and unrelenting intimidation to expand their illegal enterprises. Over time, bribes, violence, and intimidation take their toll, especially in weak states. The net effect of these assaults is to undermine a nation's rule of law, cripple its civic institutions, and reinforce the public's view that government is ineffective. The downward spiral of drug money, violence, and intimidation, once it has begun, is difficult to reverse in weak states. But this is just half the story. With a degraded or weakened rule of law environment, non-drug actors from the criminal world and their transnational counterparts step in and further exploit an already unstable situation. While drug trafficking may be the most lucrative component of transnational crime, it is hardly the only line of business. Money laundering, weapons trafficking, commercial espionage, human trafficking, smuggling, and piracy all flourish alongside illicit drug enterprises. Further declines in the rule of law, public confidence, and national governance are the consequences. The magnitude of money from illicit drugs probably cannot be underestimated. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes estimates that the global proceeds from illicit drugs range from between $100 billion to more than $1 trillion per year. Illicit drug money flows have been estimated to be the largest segment of the Afghan gross domestic product, just over 50% in 2007. In West Africa's Guinea-Bissau, it has been reported that drugs and drug-related money is the single biggest slice of their gross domestic product and growing. Drug trafficking, wherever it thrives, presents a serious threat to the national sovereignty of the afflicted state. But it is the intersection of drugs with other illegal transnational threats, especially terrorism, that makes it so treacherous. This so-called drug terror nexus links the monetary proceeds from drugs with filling the coffers of terrorist organizations like the FARC in Colombia, the Taliban in Afghanistan, and Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. According to the latest United States intelligence, terrorist groups in more than a dozen countries across three continents are significantly bankrolled by illicit drug monies. According to the Drug Enforcement Administration, 19 of the 43 groups the United States designated as foreign terrorist organizations in 2007 were involved in the drug trade or other criminal activities. In addition, drug trafficking organizations' efforts to weaken or topple local governments significantly undermines our ability to achieve vital diplomatic development and economic assistance goals overseas. Threats from these groups not only test state stability, but also undermine the goals of regional political bodies like the Organization of American States and boldly challenge international institutions like the United Nations. At today's hearing, we'll learn from experts about the linkages between illicit drugs, weak states, and the United States national security in the context of Latin America, Afghanistan, and West Africa. The subcommittee plans to hold a second hearing with the relevant government agencies and departments to examine the United States national drug control strategy 
and the planned use of the nearly $15 billion that has been requested for that purpose this year. With that, I uh, turn to Mr. Flake for his opening remarks. I thank the Chairman. Uh, he made the point that uh, it's the intersection of drugs and uh, the money that it garners for terrorist activities and other things that uh, are most concerning uh, to, to us. Uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, illicit drugs in Mexico affecting the border region like Arizona. I'm sure Mr. Olson will have some things to say about that. And also uh, the situation in Afghanistan, obviously with uh, narco-terrorism there. So uh, I, I welcome the witnesses. Thank you for uh, taking the time to come here and uh, look forward to the hearing. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll receive testimony from the witnesses, but before they begin, I'd like to just give a brief introduction of each, uh, starting from my left. Uh, Mr. Eric Olson serves as a senior advisor on security at the Mexico Institute of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He has specialized in the Americas region, but he's also worked on human rights issues in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. From 2006 to 2007, he served as a senior specialist at the Organization of American States, and from 2002 to 2006, as Amnesty International's advocacy director for the Americas. He holds an MA from American University. Mr. David Mansfield is a fellow with the Carr Center for Human Rights at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. He also works as an independent consultant for a range of organizations, including the United Kingdom government, the World Bank, and various non-governmental organizations on policy and operational issues with regard to illicit drugs in Afghanistan and on alternative livelihoods. He has previously worked on overseas drug and development issues in each of the major drug producing regions of South and Southeast Asia and Latin America. Mr. Douglas Farah, is a senior fellow at the International Assessment and Strategy Center. In 2004, he worked for nine months with the Consortium for the Study of Intelligence, studying armed groups and intelligence reform. For the two decades before that, he was a foreign correspondent and investigative reporter for the Washington Post and other publications covering Latin America and West Africa. From 2000 to 2004, he was the Washington Post West African Bureau Chief based in the Ivory Coast. He holds a BA and a BS from the University of Kansas. Dr. Vanda Felbert Brown serves as a fellow at the 21st Century Defense Initiative at the Brookings Institution, where she specializes in the interactions between illicit economies and military conflict. Dr. Felbert Brown also serves as an adjunct professor in the Security Studies Program at Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service, where she was an assistant professor prior to assuming her current position at Brookings. She holds a BA from Harvard University and a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So I want to thank all of you for bringing your substantial credentials and your experience here before the committee today. Uh, it's the policy of the committee to swear witnesses in before they testify, so I ask that you please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. I ask that the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, and as I mentioned to you uh, before the hearing, your remarks, your written remarks, will be placed on the record. And I'll uh, sh share with Mr. Uh, Mr. Flake that I, I read the remarks as you have, and I think if they were to give them here today, it would be about 35 minutes each. <laughs> so I've asked everybody to try to condense that as close to five minutes as possible, and then we'll have some questions and answers from our uh, members of the panel here. So, Mr. Olson, can we begin with you, please? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Tierney and Ranking Member Flake. It's my pleasure to be, uh, appear before you today and the distinguished members of the uh, subcommittee on behalf of the Mexico Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Established by an act of Congress in 1968, the Wilson Center is our nation's official living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. As both a distinguished scholar, the only American president with a PhD, and a national leader, President Wilson felt strongly that the scholar and the policymaker were, quote, engaged in a common enterprise. I hope I can represent successfully President Wilson's vision of bringing together the scholarly and the policy dimensions today. As you've noted already, the tragic and disturbing headlines about drug violence in Mexico have horrified and alarmed Americans about what is happening to our neighbor and strategic partner to the south. It raises real questions about the safety of Americans traveling to Mexico and for the safety and security of the United States. And given the proximity of the violence, the fact that it spills into the United States and that organized crime groups uh, in Latin America have formed strategic partnerships with organized crime in the United States, the decision to hold this hearing is not only timely but essential. 
In the brief time that I have, I would like to talk about three things. The dimension of the problem of organized crime and transnational drug trafficking in Latin America, why and how organized crime is able to take root and prosper in the region, and finally, a policy framework the U.S. and governments of Latin America may want to consider in addressing this problem. First, let me describe the problem a bit. We know that the U.S. is still the world's largest market for illegal drugs. This enormously lucrative market results in roughly 35 billion, give or take a billion, in illegal proceeds laundered back to Mexico and Colombia every year. Profit margins are so large, in fact, that according to some drug traffickers, they can lose three out of four loads of cocaine and still turn a profit. Beyond that, it's not profitable. If we were to take this as fact, it would mean that drug traffickers could lose 75% of their inventory and still turn a profit. Imagine if Ford or GM could do the same. According to the 2009 International Narcotic Control Strategy Report, all cocaine originates in the Andean countries of Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru. In 2008, the interagency assessment of co cocaine movement estimated that between 500 and 700 metric tons of cocaine departed South America headed to the United States, slightly less than uh, was coming up in 2007. While there are many different ways cocaine has moved from the Andes to the United States, one method is to, to employ small private planes to move the loads from Colombia to Central America where bundles are either dumped in the sea and retrieved or planes land on, uh, uh, or are purposely crashed on tiny landing strips in remote areas. Whatever the exact route, roughly 90% of cocaine entering the U.S. transits through Mexico. In Mexico, there are at least five major drug trafficking organizations, many more splinter groups uh, that are defending their territories, competing with one another, trying to set up new routes. Uh, some of the recent violence that we've seen in the press is the result of intra-organizational and inter-organizational conflicts and competition. As we see second-tier lieutenants, um, spin-off organizations, and cartels competing with each other as the heads or kingpins of a rival group are arrested or assassinated. So there's a lot of inter uh, organizational and intra-organizational violence. A third source of the violence is what one could expect when the government aggressively pursues them and the cartels, the trafficking organizations fight back and that's of course understandable. In Colombia where there has been a major weakening of the armed guerrilla movements, both the FARC and ELN, there is evidence that both continue to be engaged in drug-related activity. Likewise, the disbanding of the umbrella structure of paramilitary forces, this is the paramilitary demobilization that President Uribe undertook, has atomized the fighting forces, but there are new alliances being formed between local commanders, demobilized forces, and drug traffickers. In some instances, the FARC is joining with the paramilitary, an ex-paramilitary, to continue trafficking. Sadly, despite the formal dismantling of the AUC and the weakening of the guerrilla groups, Colombia still remains the largest cultivator of coca bush in the hem hemisphere. Organized crime has been quite agile in establishing new alliances that fit their business model, and they could care less about anyone's particular ideological persuasion, whether communist, leftist, anti-communist, or capitalist. To paraphrase Michael Corleone, it's not ideological, it's strictly business. Um, finally, it's important to point out that organized crime in Latin America is not limited to drug trafficking, but involves trafficking in other goods, such as pirated and counterfeit products, autos and auto parts, and cigarettes, to name a few, as well as illegal activities such as kidnapping, human trafficking, and even quote-unquote legitimate or quasi-legitimate businesses and enterprises. In many instances, and this is important, the same organizations that traffic in illegal drugs 
also traffic in products such as weapons or people or engage in apparently legitimate businesses like real estate and construction. Um, <clears throat> bottom line, there is a two-way flow of trafficked goods, money, and humans. Drugs and other pirated goods and human trafficking move north, while money, possibly half of it in cash, weapons, autos, auto parts, cigarettes move south. Now, let me say a little bit in time you know, that's remaining. Mr. Olson, you know what I'm going to suggest? Because I, having read yours, I know you have some good suggestions on where to go with this. We'll ask that question. Uh, when the round comes in as to where do we go from here, I think you've laid a great groundwork of why we okay. need to attend to this problem. And then sure. if it's fine with you, we'll just, uh, sure. on the question and answer period, get to what your suggestions for a strategy going All forward. Right. Good. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mansfield. Thank you, Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Flake. Um, you'll have to forgive me. This is a bit of a novelty for me uh, in, in the sense that I find myself in unusual surroundings. I've spent the last 18 years essentially looking at drugs from a rural development perspective. I'm far more used to the company of opium farmers and uh, traders in Afghanistan. I well, I hope you find our company uh, almost as good. Uh, <laughs> could I ask you just to put the microphone a little bit more directly in front of your, sure. uh, your mouth? And I think that'll be helpful. Thank you. Um, for me, it's clear. Illicit drugs thrive in marginal areas. Uh, these are areas that are marginal economically, politically, environmentally. They're areas uh, that are often in conflict with what is a, essentially a weak state. Uh, that conflict can be ethnic, military, it t tends to take place, uh, the cultivation takes place in disputed territory, borderlands. Um, attempts to address drug production have often involved the government actually penetrating these marginal areas, establishing state presence in all its functions, not just security apparatus, um, but to provide support to the provision of public goods, roads, education and health, and create an environment for the private sector to work. In Pakistan, this process saw cultivation move from one area to another as the state extended its writ into these areas, from Buner to Gadun Amazai to Deir to Bijou and Mamand. This process has also been successful in Southeast Asia. For me, um, given my background of 12 years in, in Afghanistan, um, Afghanistan is the anomaly. In Afghanistan, the bulk of drugs are produced in uh, are grown in areas that are accessible, not remote. It's not the borderlands. These areas have irrigation, fertile soils, and in many cases, the cultivation takes place right next to provincial centers. In Afghanistan, it is not, as in other countries, a weak state trying to penetrate marginal areas, but a marginal state trying to move beyond its provincial centers. And in Afghanistan, the impact of illegal drugs have on US national security interests are clear. I mean, given US strategic interests in Afghanistan and Pakistan, the presence of US troops, and the considerable investment the US has made in governance and security and development in the area. But the question is how to respond, and how to respond in a way that does not worsen the situation. For example, there's no doubt that drugs are, quote, fueling the insurgency. But this is not as clear-cut as much of the current narrative and analysis in the media often suggests. Much of the current discussion focuses on the Taliban and drugs, and the funds that they earn from the illegal drugs trade, Estimates range from 70 to 500 million, suggesting there's some calculation issues there. And there's claims of centralized taxation systems around opium. What I feel is this discussion neglects the decentralized nature, nature of the Taliban, the fact that there is no single insurgency but a disparate collection of insurgent groups. And fundamentally, it neglects that in the south of the country, there is a widespread view that whether right or wrong, it is corrupt government officials that are more involved in the drugs trade than the Taliban or groups associated with. In this case, we have to question how much of the insurgency is a reaction to government. After all, after all, people expect insurgents to fund themselves in whatever way possible, theft, kidnap, drugs, but they don't expect their government to do so, or those in government to do so. The policy response to the current narrative on the Taliban and drugs funding is to prioritize those traffickers with links to insurgent groups. But does this not potentially increase the market power of those corrupt officials involved in the drugs trade? If, it, if so, it seems it would do little to reduce the flow of drugs from Afghanistan and actually reduce the legitimacy of the government of Afghanistan in the eyes of the people. A further example of policy that can potentially exacerbate the impact of illicit drugs is that of eradication. There have in the past been a push for er aggressive eradication 
And these calls persist. They may even increase if cultivation increases in the 2009-10 growing season, which seems probable. I believe eradication and the threat of it can play a catalytic role in areas where farmers have viable alternatives. I've seen it work in districts around provincial centres in the east and the north of the country. But where farmers don't have alternatives, and there are many areas, due to the resource base that they have or insecurity, alternatives simply don't exist. And in these areas, eradication leads to economic problems and in consequence growing insecurity and provides an entry point for insurgent groups. In these areas, development investments are the priority. And, have, and we have to recognize a level of opium cultivation is a reality for some time to come. Ultimately, there is need to see illicit drugs in context. We need to recognize the threat they pose, but we need to ensure that the response does not exacerbate that. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, well done. I, even after you saw that the trap door didn't open on Mr. Olson, you still managed to finish in five minutes, so we appreciate that. <laughs> Mr. Farrar, please. Uh, Chairman Tierney and Ranking Member Flake, thank you for the opportunity to talk about something that I do believe is a true national security threat to the United States, Latin America, and West Africa. What we are seeing in the era of globalization is the development of flexible criminal and terrorist pipelines where key facilitators are vital to the operations of both sets of actors, and they are highly adaptable and forward-thinking. These pipelines or recombinant chains of actors and commodities now have the ability to move illicit goods around the globe to wherever the environment, environment is most tolerant. The most lucrative commodities, as noted, are cocaine and heroin, but it is the same pipelines that serve weapon, weapons traffickers, human smugglers, fraud, and contraband. While the cocaine from the Andean region traditionally moved through Central America, Mexico, and Caribbean, West Africa has become a new and extremely challenging part of the distribution network. The growth of, growth of transcontinental drug trafficking structures in recent years with the capacity to project their operations from Latin America to West Africa is a sobering reminder of the wealth and creativity of these structures and their ability to co-opt in uh, already weak and failing states. There are several causes of concern for the United States in the emerging cocaine nexus. The first is the presence of Mexican drug trafficking organizations, particularly the Sinaloa cartel in West Africa. The second is the presence of the FARC there. The FARC in the past decade has morphed into one of the world's uh, largest cocaine trafficking syndicates, and both the United States and the European Union have designated it a terrorist, a terrorist organization. The presence of the Mexican organizations in the FARC in West Africa and that cocaine pipeline mean that these groups can reap and re repatriate their profits even if the United States were to make significant progress in reducing the flow of drugs across its own southern border. The market for the drugs may change, but the beneficiaries of these illicit gains largely remain in Mexico, Colombia, and in our, our hemisphere. While the FARC has suffered a series of defeats in the past 18 months, its ability to move cocaine to the U.S. market uh, has been severely cur curtailed. But with the tolerance, if not complicity, of the Venezuelan government, the FARC has managed to significantly reroute its movements from Venezuela to West Africa with destinations such as Guinea-Bissau, Guinea-Conakry, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Ghana. Another important point is that the ungoverned spaces of West Africa are providing a meeting ground for criminal and terrorist groups to make new alliances. What I have observed in more than two decades of dealing with tra drug trafficking, transnational, and criminal organizations is that when they are able to meet in neutral territory, they often form alliances that would not be possible under other circumstances. Already in Guinea-Bissau, Guinea-Conakry, Ghana, Sierra Leone, we are seeing me members of Mexican, Colombian, Venezuelan, Surinamese, European, and European organizations operating in the same territory and plugging into the same pipeline, often co-mingling with the Lebanese cr crime syndicates that control the contraband and blood diamond trade. Just as the blood diamond trade allowed groups like the Revolutionary United Front in Sierra Leone to purchase advanced weapons and become a more lethal force, the influx of cocaine cash will allow the criminal and militia groups in the region to acquire more sophisticated weapons, trainings, and communications. At the same time, the weak host states have virtually have severely limited ability to confront these groups. As noted, the UN Office of Drug, Drugs and Crime conservatively estimates that 40 to 50 tons of cocaine with an estimated value of $1.8 billion passed through West Africa in 2007 and is growing rapidly. The Pentagon's Africa Command and other intelligence services estimate the amount of cocaine tra transiting West Africa to be at least five times that estimate. Using UN figures, the only legal export from the region that would surpass the value of cocaine is cacao from Ivory Coast. If the higher numbers are used, cocaine could dwarf the legal exports of all the region combined and be worth more than the GDP of several of the region's nations. None of this is happening in a vacuum. 
The changes across the globe have been swift and dramatic in recent years, with the number of failed states growing from 11 in 1996 to close to 30 today. More than half of those, 18, are in sub-Saharan Africa. This trend is important because these growing areas that are either stateless or governed by states that are in practice functioning criminal enterprises give rise to, give rise to hybrid, criminal, uh, hybrid organizations that make the traditional distinctions between terrorism and organized crime, particularly drug trafficking, meaningless. One of, the dis one of the reasons for the dismal state of governance in West Africa is that since the 1990s, the region has suffered a series of conflicts centered on natural resources such as diamonds, timber, oil, and gold. These resources, while valuable, pale in comparison to the money the cocaine trade generates. For example, at the height of the blood diamond trade in Sierra Leone and Liberia, the total value of diamonds being smuggled out was less than $200 million. The potential to fuel conflicts over uh, co the cocaine pipeline, the most lucrative commodity so far, and one whose profits are several order of magnitudes larger than diamonds, is truly frightening. There is a broader potential danger that must be kept in mind as we assess the emerging trends in West Africa. I mentioned hybrid criminal organizations such as the FARC. In West Africa, it is Hezbollah, the Lebanese-based Shia Muslim organization that has long maintained an operational presence on the ground and has significant role in the blood diamond trade and other illicit activities. It is inevitable that these organizations and the drug trafficking groups will encounter each other and mutually benefit because each has something the other one wants. More worrisome on our hemisphere is evidence that Hugo Ch of Hugo Chavez's direct support for Hezbollah, including the June 18, 2008 OFAC designations of two uh, senior Venezuelan citizens, including a senior diplomat, as Hezbollah supporters. Given Iran's ties to Hezbollah and Venezuela, Hezbollah's ties to Iran and the FARC, and the FARC's history of building alliances with other groups, and the presence of Hezbollah and other armed Islamist groups in Latin America and West Africa, it would be dangerous to dismiss the possibility of an alliance of these actors. The histories of these groups indicate that they will take advantage of the corrupt and weak states in West Africa to get to know each other, work together, learn from each other, and exploit areas of mutual interest. Unfortunately, the primary area of mutual interest is a hatred of the United States. And I will leave it there. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for those remarks. Doctor. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I am honored to have this opportunity to address the committee on this important issue. I'll focus my comments on some general dynamics of the drug conflict nexus and then provide a comparative assessment of the significance of these manifestations of the drug conflict nexus to U.S. national security. And if time permits, I'll conclude with some recommendations for U.S. policy. The penetration of illicit economies by terrorist or insurgent groups provides an especially potent threat to states and regional stability since unlike crime organizations, belligerent groups usually tend to have bigger goals, including to completely eliminate uh, the existing states present in particular locales or countries. Illicit economies provide uh, for belligerent groups the opportunity to increase their power along multiple dimensions, not simply in terms of financial profits. Financial profits are very important because with increased financial profits, belligerent groups can increase their fighting capabilities, hire a greater number of better paid combatants, uh, buy better weapons, and simplify their logistical and supply chains, or critical for the conduct of violent opposition to the state. But crucially, and frequently neglected in policy considerations, belligerents who participate in illicit economies frequently also obtain what I call political capital namely legitimacy with and support from local populations who are dependent on the illicit economy for basic livelihood. And they obtain this political capital by protecting the populations from government efforts to repress the illicit economy in the absence of legal livelihoods. They also provide a variety of other protection and regulatory services. And with this political capital and the ability to provide these regulatory services and protection services, they have the capacity to transform themselves from mere violent actors to violent actors that take on the functions of a proto-state. Although the political capital that belligerents obtain is frequently very thin, it is nonetheless sufficient to motivate the population not to provide intelligence on the belligerents to government. And this is critical, such human actionable Intelligence is critical for the success of counterinsurgency and counterterrorism efforts, as well as um, for uh, the effectiveness of law enforcement. Several factors influence the size of the political capital, but in a nutshell, it is most, uh, it is strongest in areas where uh, the uh, country is poor, the illicit economy is labor-intensive, 
and hence can provide employment opportunity for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, thuggish traffickers are present and the government is suppressing the illicit economy in the absence of legal livelihoods. Policies that focus on degrading the belligerents' physical resources, such as stopping their financial flows, are frequently ineffective because it is extraordinarily difficult to attempt to bankrupt belligerent groups through eradication or interdiction measures. Yet they are also counterproductive if uh, they target the wider population dependent on the illicit economy. Counter-narcotics policies thus needs to be weighed very carefully with a clear eye toward uh, the, the counterinsurgency and counterterrorism implications. Seemingly quick fixes, such as blanket eradication in the absence of alternative livelihoods, will only strengthen the insurgency, not accomplish the goal of bankrupting the insurgency, while compromise state building and ultimately counter-narcotics efforts themselves. Nowhere is the nexus of drugs and insurgency uh, so vital to, and so uh, counterproductive for U.S. national primary security interests as in Afghanistan. We've already heard that uh, drugs are fueling the Taliban. They're also corrupting the government and not undermining the legitimacy of the Afghan government. But the seriousness of the threat and the strategic importance of the stakes do not uh, necessarily imply that aggressive counter-narcotic suppression policies in Afghanistan today are inappropriate policies. Indeed, premature eradication will only make matters worse, as it has already. And so the uh, Obama administration's new policy for counter-narcotics in Afghanistan gives hope that uh, the deficiency of the existing policies will be redressed. Moreover, success in suppressing poppy in Afghanistan may well increase threats to U.S. security in other ways. Given the persistent global demand and, in fact, increasing global demand for opiates, the illicit economy will simply shift elsewhere. There is a very uh, good chance and a worrisome chance that poppy will shift back to Pakistan, to uh, the areas that Mr. Mansfield already mentioned, but also possibly to Kashmir and uh, even parts of Punjab. In that case, jihadi groups of the greatest uh, danger would not only have the capacity to increase their profits, but most dangerously increase their political capital. Right now, all they can uh, afford uh, the local populations is ideological sucker. If the poppy economy shifts to Pakistan, they'll be able to provide real-time material benefits and greatly strengthen their struggle against the state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we definitely want to get into uh, all the other things that were in your written remarks, and if we shouldn't at the end, we're going to give you an opportunity to go back and, and cover anything you think that we should have questioned about and, and may not have hit on. Uh, now, we're going into a, a section of the hearing now where we'll do five minutes of questioning a member. Since there uh, are only one, two, three, about five or six of us here, I think we may do several rounds on that, if it's okay with the witnesses on that. Let me start uh, by noting that, Mr. Olson, you indicate that these people could lose 75 percent of all their inventory and still report a, a significant profit. Uh, and uh, Dr. Felber Brown, you, you talked that, it's, that it is not a single case where eradication has ever bankrupted a belligerent into defeat and that attempts to turn off income uh, through demand, uh, through other systems is highly in, uh, intelligence and resource intensive, very difficult to do. Mr. Farrar, you talk about revenue from drugs far exceeding natural resources like that from diamonds and, and other and timber and things, and indicated that in Colombia it went from 95 percent of the, the cocoa produced to 54 percent, but that just meant that Peru and Bolivia picked up. So we, we seem to be you know, this cyclical thing going here. How are we going to take the profit out of this? Now, now nobody mentioned what I think is the 800-pound gorilla in the room, which is uh, decriminalization or, or legalization of this, take the profit out of this thing. How, how do we take the profit out of this enterprise uh, if we're not going to do that? I mean, I'll just start with whoever wants to go first on that. Doctor? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it is absolutely critical that we address global demand for narcotics. This has been the most underemphasized component of U.S. counter-narcotics policy for many decades. Although nominally it's on the books, it's always the most under-resourced, least uh, a privileged policy. This applies to both treatment and prevention. The Obama administration has committed itself to making addressing uh, demand a key priority. Uh, we have yet not seen it in the current budget, but uh, perhaps uh, as uh, the next budget will be drafted, the shift in uh, balances will take place. It is also uh, vital that we help other countries around the world address demand. Our supply-side policy, as important as they are, and there is a definite role for law enforcement 
including for eradication, if it is sequenced well, must also focus much more on global, on, on global demand and demand um, increases. In fact, we have seen many new markets emerging that uh, perhaps not as high as US market are nonetheless very significant. Russia, China is back, Brazil, other parts of uh, Asia. And yet our supply side policies uh, do very little, if nothing, on helping countries address growing demand. Okay, I, I guess I hear what you're saying, but it gives back to my question. Demand production, reduction would probably take a significant amount of time. It's not going to happen overnight, certainly not in a couple of years. Our supply side policies have been fairly ineffective, I and mean, they're effective incidentally, uh, case by case, but certainly they haven't reduced the amount of drugs on the street and, and the amount being produced. And as you said, uh, there are new areas developing all the time, whether it's Russia or Brazil or somewhere else. So I go back to my question, how do we take how do we really and dramatically take the profit out of this to make a serious impact? Mr. Farrar. Well, I do think that you know, we have a 40-year or longer record in the, the war on drugs, and, and I've spent 25 years covering it fairly closely. And every new strategy that comes along has some success, and then eventually the traffickers are able to adapt around it or, or fairly quickly. Um, I'm not sure that the, the country is ready for a debate on decriminalization and, and other aspects, but I think it is clear if you look at, I mean, it, the fact is, as Eric said, you can go from lose 75 percent or you can move your coke from Africa to Latin America to Africa and then and then north indicates that the, the profit margins are huge so I do think we have to come at it I think uh, as, uh, as uh, Vanda said you know you we, when we reduced our oil consumption by three or four percent the price of oil dropped from 140 150 dollars a barrel to to forty dollars a barrel and I think you'd have a similar I, I, I'm not sure when you, when you're getting at decriminalization or other things that that's any more quick, any quicker a solution than s focusing very heavily on the on the on the consumption side, uh, because that's clearly the way. If you're selling less, you're going to lose less money. That, I, if you one could debate decriminalization, but I think it would be a long and drawn out debate in the country right now. I don't think there's any consensus on which way to go on that. So I would I would uh, second uh, what Vanda said about the need to sim to really focus on the the use reduction because that's what's going to make them able to sell less and, and give them less money. Is this the quickest thing we can do? If efficiently now. Mr. Olson? Uh, well, um, I, you know, the Woodrow Wilson Center hasn't taken a position, wouldn't take a position on decriminalization or legalization or harm reduction. Uh, I do note that uh, three countries, three major countries in Latin America now are, you know, experimenting, if you will, with the idea of decriminalization. Uh, Argentina, Chile, and uh, uh, Mexico have recently taken steps that either dramatically reduced cr criminal penalties uh, or, you know, uh, yeah, mostly criminal penalties. You know, we'll see if that, that helps in any way. All those countries, especially Mexico, have a growing consumption problem. So uh, if, if that's what it takes, I personally, I think it has to be a combination of efforts. There's no magic bullet here. I think Doug was right. We try new things, they work for a little while, and they fall apart. And I think having a consistent, multidimensional, uh, multifaceted approach that looks at decriminalization as an option, but also looks at you know, raising the cost of doing business for traffickers um, and, and does some things in terms of international cooperation, I don't think any of them by themselves will solve this problem, but we have to hit them on all fronts, if you will, and that, that's, I think, the best we can hope for. Thank you. Mr. Flake. Thank you, and thank you to all the witnesses. Mr. Olson, um, you mentioned the inter and intra-party uh, or uh, cartel uh, battle that's going yeah. on in Mexico, and certainly we've seen that going on for a while. Has, has that caused a realignment yet of uh, these cartels? Have we seen much change? Um, we're, we're often told in Arizona that uh, uh, we haven't seen really a spike in, in, in violence. This is a necessary thing because Calderon has, has finally gone after the cartels. Do you, have you seen an improvement uh, between Mexico's ability, the government's ability to control these cartels given what has gone on over the past several months? 
You know, I think the Mexican government is doing some things well. I was there a little over a month ago, and they're clearly uh, investing a lot in building a national police force that's modern, strong, professional, and capable. Um, there are another a there are aspects of their policy that are lagging behind, and and what has happened in say particularly the case of Ciudad Juarez, right on the U.S. Mex uh, Texas border, El Paso is that you've had the military and police move in and somewhat scatter the Juarez cartel uh, to other parts uh, south. And then as that happens, the Sinaloa cartel in particular has tried to take advantage of a weakened Juarez cartel. And w w so what we've seen over the last six months is a spike in violence, then a decline in violence as the Juarez cartel was scattered, and now uh, an upward tick, a uh, quite serious upward tick in violence. So I, I you know, I don't, I don't think we've seen the end of it yet. There hasn't been, uh, they haven't gotten to somewhere where the cartels themselves are so weakened uh, that they can't uh, uh, carry out incredibly violent operations. The cartels in general, I mean, there are exceptions like the, this Familia Michoacan, which is another animal altogether. And cartels in general don't like to engage in this outrageous violence. They're more interested in the business aspect of it. But they do, I think, uh, uh, engage in that kind of violence when they're competing for territory and routes amongst themselves. Thank you. Mr. Mansfield, you mentioned uh, in Afghanistan the <coughs> Uh, it's the marginal state, I guess, is how you put it, moving beyond its boundaries, uh, suggesting that some of these uh, these uh, organizations, drug organizations, have had free reign up to now. What is the uh, effect of having a policy of eradication for a while? We seem to have backed off from that now. We'll likely be back to it <laughs> uh, a while later. Uh, what what does that do for the long term, and, and is is that obviously it seems to be problematic if we can't decide on a policy? Um, you mentioned, and others have mentioned that there are uh, uh, other products that can be produced economically, uh, but we've not really seen that. Whether it's pomegranate or whatever else, uh, the government certainly hasn't pursued a policy that uh, would replace those crops. I, I just, I guess, I'm, I'm wondering what is the net effect of of moving toward eradication policy and then backing from it and then possibly back to it again. Um, thank you. Um, I think the debate, the debate on eradication is is often a little simplistic, um, and I do see this 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 pendulum swing that's right. taking place, and uh, I have some reservations about it. I think too often we neglect the fact that there are areas in Afghanistan that do have viable alternatives, where I'm, I can you know, cite them, introduce you to farmers who have moved out of poppy cultivation. They weren't dependent on it. They have a range of other crops that they can produce. They're near the provincial center. They have markets for their crops. They're growing maybe five crops on one unit of land instead of opium poppy. And if you look at the net returns on those crops, they're more attractive than opium poppy. Opium poppy is incredibly labor intensive. Once you start buying in labor to, do the, to grow this crop, it cuts your profit margins. These other crops, five crops for one is attractive. One unit of land rotated. Some of them have multiple harvests, gives you steady income flow. Uh, they they um, give you different season, different harvests at different points. Again, steady income flow. And because there's a market, traders are turning up at the farm gate and they're buying them. They're reducing the transaction costs of, of um, moving goods to market. They're reducing the transportation costs, not unlike opium used to be in these areas. So where you have the kind of security, governance, and economic growth taking place, farmers are moving out. And as a consequence of growing other crops, they free up their labor. These aren't as labor intensive as opium poppy. Mm. So then members of the family go off and work in the city. So the combination of the intercropping, multiple crops, and then subsequently the labor means that the returns are higher than poppy. Mm. So in those areas, the threat of eradication or eradication is credible, and it actually acts as a catalyst. The problem has been 
that we've had too much of an idea of a comprehensive eradication. So it's, let's eradicate everyone. Let's wipe out all the poppy in Nangahar, all the poppy in Balkh. Now, some areas can cope. They can actually thrive. Some areas do not cope because they just don't have those facilities. They're not near the markets. They're inaccessible. They're remote. Every time they travel down the road, they are asked for bakshish. They're asked for a bribe from the police, moving their tomatoes to market. So you're not opposed to eradication specifically in certain areas or as part of the program, but not uh, as just a general policy? Of no, I mean, I, I, for me, I've, you know, I've written on this many times. I mean, it's, it's under what conditions it works yeah. and under what conditions it's counterproductive. The danger I think we have is, you know, there is a real potential for poppy cultivation to go up this year as a function of a whole range of different things. The price on wheat and poppy has significantly changed. Over the last two years, wheat has actually been an attractive crop because the wheat, global wheat price was so high, opium price has been low. It's, been, it's made more sense in many areas to grow wheat on your land because you'll get more wheat from doing that than grow opium poppy on your land to grow wheat. The terms of trade were different. That's changed now. We're back to a situation where opium poppy is once again attractive. So that fact is in place, meaning people will go back to poppy in many areas. The other side is the politics. Certain governors will be rewarded or punished in relation to the, the election. They'll be moved on, as I say, to a better place or a worse. Uh, and they have been quite active in reducing poppy. Mm -hmm. So the politics is shifting, the economics is shifting, and there's a danger that because there's a perception that there's no eradication this year, that gets blamed for this, this shift. That shift was set in place some time ago. So then we end up with, oh, poppy's gone up. It's due to the fact there's no eradication. We need aggressive eradication again. So it comes around again. And I think we need to stop dealing with poppy farmers as if they're a homogenous entity. I'm sure wheat farmers in, in the United States are not a homogenous entity. Some have small land, some have large land, some have combines, some. It's, it's too simplistic, some of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mr. Quigley, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman from Arizona touched on the issues in Mexico, but it is something that's interesting in reading your written testimony and Mr. Mansfield, some of your oral testimony. It's often described as a weak state issue, while not a world power, clearly as compared to the other countries we're talking about, Mexico you know, is, is much different. What does it suggest? as it relates to an issue of whether or not we're dealing with weak powers here that Mexico seems to thrive so much? Well, Mexico seems, I don't think Mexico can be described as a weak state as, as compared to the others, yet it seems to thrive in much the same way. I mean, what, are, what am I missing or what can we learn from that? Well, I, I, I I think you're absolutely right. You can't overgeneralize. You can't compare uh, Mexico to Haiti, for instance, or Mexico to Honduras. Uh, Mexico is uh, much wealthier, much greater resources. The issue in Mexico, however, is that uh, it's m a much more complex problem. You have, for instance, in the case of Mexico, uh, a federal police force that's roughly 30,000 <clears> persons um, and they have authority or control over about 8% of the crime. The vast majority of the crime happens at the local level, and these organized crime groups will operate at the local level. And the local police, the state municipal police, especially in states like Chihuahua, are, are, are ineffective, are weak basically. So I'm not making a broad generalization about weakness of the Mexican state. It's more the fact that in particular areas of the government, uh, of the country, in particular states, in particular localities, uh, organized crime has found a foothold and has been able to penetrate that local state, the municipal governments, even the state governments, in a way that it can't probably at a federal level. And that's allowed that cancer, if you will, to grow and expand over, expand over a period of time. Um, I would never say that Mexico as a whole is at risk of failure or is a particular uh, weak state, but certainly at part, local par, uh, localities uh, it is, and that's what they're battling with right now. Doctor? 
um, to follow up on um, Mr. Olson's comments, Mexico is also a democratizing state and in many ways an under-institutionalized state. Law enforcement apparatus, for example, is um, deeply flawed in Mexico. And although Mexico is finally taking important police reforms, in fact, Mexico has attempted to undertake these police reforms at least since the late 1980s to little effect, and there are some encouraging signs today, it is still really struggling in the provision of public safety and law enforcement, not simply in relationship to organized crime, although that's absolutely vital, but also with respect to street crime. And as long as Mexico's police forces cannot assure its citizens that safety um, and governance presence will be uh, effective, susceptibility to mobilization by um, armed actors, by crime groups, will be high. Uh, Mexico is an outlier uh, in many ways uh, from the discussion that we were having because the major aspects of the illegal economy are not labor intensive. It is mainly trafficking. And that fortunately greatly limits the power that crime groups can acquire in Mexico along with the very high brutality. Yet at the same time, the cartel's ability to penetrate informal economies in Mexico, sales of DVDs that Eric mentioned, for example, allows them still to function as providers of both employment as well as at least minimal security in the absence of the state. We also have to realize that uh, despite uh, Mexico's uh, status as at least a middle-income country and impressive wealth, um, at least 40% of its population still exists in condition of poverty that is actually increasing. Many of these marginalized people, both in rural areas as well as in urban settings, have access to only minimum um, public goods provided by the state. And so it is vital that Mexico reconceptualizes its approach to the cartels from thinking about them simply as narrow drug enterprises that can be um, eliminated through limited interdiction actions uh, toward thinking about them as much more than that, for providing these various social functions for the populations, and hence uh, try to develop socioeconomic component of the policies in addition to interdiction, in addition to police reform, in addition to intelligence capacity building, to sever the link between the population and the cartels. Then intelligence flows will improve greatly and the effectiveness of law enforcement will be far greater than we have seen so far. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Quigley. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm very interested in, the, um, in Mr. Mansfield's comments from the standpoint that um, my state and my area where I come from just sent over the second group of uh, National Guardsmen to work with the uh, Afghan farmers to try and train them on how to grow other crops other than, than uh, poppies. So, uh, you know, it would appear to me that if Afghanistan, if I'm not mistaken, 95 percent of the world's heroin comes from there, is that right? So it would, if we could do something there to transfer them from growing that to other beneficial crops. But I know that it, it's interesting to me, that it would seem to me would, in order to be able to do that, they have to have viable markets for the products that they sell. And I was interested in your remarks there when you said something about that, that uh, uh, they were trying to do that. It was based on profit, whether they actually did it or not. So I assume from that as well, I'm kind of rambling here, but I want to try and get in enough questions here that I can get my five minutes in. Um, that it would appear that the farmers actually grow their own crops, that they are grown by the drug folks themselves, and then they sell the crop, I guess, to the drug folks. Is that correct? Uh, and then uh, if, they, if they own their own crop, they can add then that uh, the drug folks actually don't grow the crops themselves. So if you could just kind of elaborate on uh, the ability of us to impact uh, the growth of, uh, uh, you know, something besides uh, poppies over there, as well as uh, just sort of a, a little quick primer on uh, how the, the, the drug trade actually operates over there, if you would, please. I should have brought my, uh, my Nestar and Rambay to explain how the opium poppy cultivation process, but uh, I suspect I wouldn't be here. I might be in a, some kind of prison if I tried to enter the country with that. But um, <laughs> I mean, again, there, there is, we need to be, clear on what farming looks like in Afghanistan. We have a picture here of a farmer stood within his poppy field. But what we don't see there is the area of land that's grown with wheat next to it, which he needs to consume. 
we don't see his family plot of vegetables that they grow to feed the family. Some might be sold, depending on circumstance. So we have a particular kind of, again, it's this particular narrative of the poppy farmer. Most farmers in Afghanistan grow a range of different crops, and it's a question of the distribution of crops that they grow, the proportion of land that would be poppy. So part of this is about raising the risks associated with poppy and reducing the risks associated with engaging in the legal economy. Many of the goods they produce simply don't have a market. They grow them to consume. And when they try and take them to market, if they're in a remote area, they get hit with checkpoints, asking for money. In some cases, we've had commanders, even officials of the government, commandeering that crop, buying at a low price. Sorry. If I can interrupt just for a second. Is there an effort to try and develop these markets, though, so that if they produce a crop in excess, they can sell that excess? So there would be an opportunity then for for them to, there'd be an incentive for them to produce more and therefore change over from crops. And I guess, uh, is, is, and I guess the second part of the question is, it, is it realistic to believe that we can eradicate them, you know, eradicate poppy growing in that area, or is that just a pipe dream? Sure, there's a lot of investments in this. I mean, but the question is, where does the market lie? The market of Kabul, the market of Jalalabad, you know, they're big. But the market of Lashkagar and Helmand is limited. If you're growing poppy, if you're growing a range of different crops in, in Helmand, you're not selling it in Lashkagar. Is there an effort, though, to increase these markets or develop markets for these folks so that there's an incentive to do that? Part of it is there, is there are those efforts, but part of it is the security environment. If I can't get down the road, I mean, I have farmers who grow a, uh, onion in Nawa, who have, we've been interviewing for a number of years. Um, it's very near Lashkagar, but they know they can't, if the market for onion in Lashkagar is limited, Kandahar is the real market, but he knows that if he moves his, uh, his onion to Kandahar, he has 14 checkpoints along that road who are going to ask for money. He knows that the haulier who moves that crop wants extra money because it's a dangerous road to drive down. So the markets don't function. And the great thing about opium poppy for these farmers is it functions. I don't have to take the physical risk of traveling down the road, and I don't have to take the economic risk of getting to market and being a price taker and finding that I, I can't sell my onion at a profit. And I have farmers who basically have grown onion, realize they can't make a profit, and basically taken what they need, offer the fellow villagers what they need, and then left the rest to rot. So one issue is the security side. On the market side, as I say, you have finite markets uh, size of markets. So one of the big questions is issues of local procurement. How do we stimulate the market? We keep looking for export markets, you know, these miracle crops, pomegranates, apricots, saffron, mint, one thing after another. Most of those crops have foreign markets, but actually there is a foreign market within Afghanistan, which is the international community. Actually stimulating the market for legal goods by us, the international community, buying more local produce is a, would be a major advantage. I think also not only economically but politically, the whole issue of we eat the same food. I mean, I've sat in some PRTs, one in, in, in Orozgar, and you're constantly thinking, where's the market for the goods? They grow fantastic apricots and almonds and these other things. Where's the market? We have to get it to Kandahar. The road's dangerous. They've just sort of uh, got rid of the highway police. Instead of robbing people officially, they're now robbing people unofficially. So where's the market? The PRT. We're sat among 6,000 soldiers. We're part of that market. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Olson, what factors, uh, in your view, are, are at play in spurring the, the big, uh, rapid growth of cocaine in West Africa? Or um, somebody else? I probably should defer here to okay. Doug, but... Um, well, we'll defer to Doug, if you want us to. The factors in Mexican trafficking moving to their product to West Africa, sir? Right. Um, well, part of it is that uh, U.S. interdiction efforts have been uh, very good. It's harder for the Colombians to get their, their product from uh, Colombia through Central America to, to Mexico. And I think the opening of uh, the Venezuelan avenue for moving uh, product from Colombia via Venezuela 
to the west is uh, or to the east is is now much more attractive than it was before because the, particularly the FARC with this relationship with Chavez is able to take advantage of that as are the Bolivian what what you saw for many years was that the Bolivian traffickers growing coca were not allowed to produce ACL the, the final product because the Colombians wanted that for themselves they're no longer able to control the Bolivians or the or the Peruvians mm -hmm. if if I'm if I might I'd, I'd add a couple yeah, more go things um, which is uh, when we saw a spike in, in, in the trafficking to Europe uh, through West Africa, it also coincided with a, a very favorable exchange rate exactly. in Europe. In other words, and, and by exporting market, yeah. and, 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 and right. as the exchange rate improved, improved uh, for the consumer, <laughs> uh, in other words, it got cheaper, consumption went way up. So there, it's a market and they move in that direction and then the, the, the possibility of, uh, of uh, shipping it to Europe opened up, as uh, Mr. Ferris said, because Western Air uh, Africa was uh, a very weak open area that they could exploit as a transshipment. Uh, one one final thing is that Brazil has become a very big market, and a lot of the Bolivian and other stuff moves through Brazil to the Portuguese-speaking parts of West Africa where they have a language advantage, particularly Guinea-Bissau and Angola. So you have a language, uh, and if you look geographically, they're quite close. Mm -hmm. uh, Brazil has become a very large consumption market, and the Bolivians and Peruvians find it much easier in some cases to go through Brazil out to, to West Africa where, the, again, the Brazilian um, ability to, with language particularly is a very useful thing to have. Okay. And are there, are there links uh, that have been established between uh, some of the terrorist organizations in Africa, you know, Al-Qaeda and in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, in criminal drug, traffic, uh, drug trafficking elements? I think what you're seeing in terms of the, the small shipments that move through the Tuareg smuggling networks and things from uh, West Africa through the Trans-Sahel region up, up going north is that you're seeing an increasingly, uh, increasing amount of small cocaine shipments but not the major shipments going through that route. And what you see is the Tuaregs and other groups that will have to have a relationship with Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb uh, now buying a lot of Chinese weapons with that money so they're much better armed and they're much more lethal than they were before which can rebound to the, to the benefit of uh, Al Qaeda and Islam in Maghreb, but uh, sort of official ties or them joining up, I don't think we've seen yet. I think that uh, the amounts of you're seeing one and two, three kilo loads moving moving that way. They still prefer cigarettes, gasoline, other things that they can smuggle. They know how to smuggle, um, but I think the potential because you're in a, an un, ungoverned space where groups will they'll need the same facilitators to move their product. Will I, I don't think it's uh, irrational to assume that that okay. will at some point take place. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you for the question. I, it brings into focus the, the larger issue of how uh, terrorist groups, Belgian groups, penetrate illicit economies. And we frequently fall into uh, the idea that the illicit economy becomes altogether captured or dominated by the belligerent group. Take, for example, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb and some of the known uh, participation in the uh, Moroccan drug trade. Well, it is true, but it would be um, incorrect to imagine that the entire Moroccan uh, marijuana and hashish trade is dominated by Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb. In fact, I would posit that their slice of the trade is very small. Similarly, in Afghanistan, although the Taliban is profiting and benefiting in multiple ways, very many other actors also participate in the drug trade, and it is far from the province of and the Taliban. In Colombia, yes, the FARC is part of the drug trade, as is the ELN, but to a much larger extent, former paramilitary groups that in many cases were essentially identical to drug trafficking groups uh, dominated the trade more. And there still today are very many independent traffickers and independent trading organizations. In fact, it would be very rare and quite uh, unusual for a belligerent group to have the capacity to completely dominate the entire illicit economy, especially in the case of extensive labor-intensive economies. The flip side of that is that belligerent groups rarely rely on simply one illicit economy for their funding. Uh, the case of Taliban, FARC, many other uh, Al-Qaeda are, are certainly prominent, where they have highly diversified portfolios with much money coming from ordinary fundraising, from donations, from participation in other illicit economies, from taxation of legal uh, products in areas where they function. 
and it is this diversification and multiple sources and the ease with which they can move from one funding to another that makes efforts to suppress the money by targeting the illicit economy or uh, by trying to undertake anti-money laundering measures so very difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Mr. Murphy, you recognize five minutes. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Those buzzes indicate that we have votes on the floor, so I'll be uh, brief. But I wanted to follow up on Mr. Welsh's uh, line of questioning and uh, to uh, Mr. Farah specifically to the issue of uh, Hezbollah's presence in uh, West Africa. In your testimony, you spend a decent amount of time talking about um, their presence there, the amount of money moving from West Africa back uh, to the Middle East. Um, and I just want to sort of ask the question that uh, Mr. Welsh asked specific to Hezbollah, and um, what are the prospects moving forward for there to be a greater degree of reliance potentially in West Africa upon the drug trade to potentially uh, add to the money going going back. Um, so let me just ask that question. What, what do you see as the current nexus uh, between Hezbollah specifically and the growing uh, drug trade in West Africa, and uh, what do we worry about in terms of trends going forward? Well, I think that's a very important question to which I don't think we actually know the answer yet. The Hezbollah is on the ground there, uh, but the, the, let's say the diamond, the blood diamond dealers that I, that I dealt with there, they don't, they weren't organically Hezbollah. Hezbollah would tax them and take part of their money, as I believe is the same is true in the tri-border area in Latin America and other parts. Hezbollah it doesn't run the trade. Hezbollah profits mightily from the trade by the taxation and ability to, and providing protection, but they're not organically linked to, to Hezbollah. I think that as the, as the Colombian and Brazilian and other uh, organizations move into West Africa, they're either going to have to cut a deal with the traditional Lebanese these crime families that, that dominate, or it's going to get very bloody. And it has not gotten bloody, which to me indicates if you have products that you want to move from West Africa to Europe, you almost have to go through the Lebanese networks because that's the pipeline that exists and they know how to move stuff. Uh, when Al Qaeda wanted to move its diamond profits, it didn't set up its own thing in West Africa. It went to the Hezbollah network and moved and moved diamonds that way. Um, and I think that that is what's happening with the drug trade. They're going to, then I think it's going to strengthen the, the Hezbollah folks because they're going to profit from providing protection and movement for those particular products. Whether that becomes organically linked to Hezbollah, I, I doubt it will because that's not the way Hezbollah tends, tends to operate. Um, but I think that uh, it will strengthen all the criminal networks because cocaine is a product that is useful to the pipeline and uh, the pipeline is useful to cocaine traffickers. So there has, there's a symbiosis that has to take place and if it doesn't get really bloody, which it hasn't, then I would argue, I would say that indicates a, a level of cooperation that, that's growing. Um, uh, then let me ask this follow-up, which is, um, and part of the comments, uh, especially from Dr. Philbaugh Brown, was about the fact that even if we were to do something uh, to try to prevent a growing reliance or a growing connection between the drug trade and um, terrorist networks, it, I'm, I'm probably oversimplifying what you said, but that it may not matter because they'll be able to go other places. Um, and so my question is, to the, ex to the extent that we do have a worry that the networks become much more interdependent and interlinked, what, do, what are our strategies uh, as a nation to try to prevent, um, I mean, we obviously you know, want to do something about drug trafficking on its own, but what, do, what are our strategies that we take to try to prevent um, those connections from being uh, made um, in, the, in the future relative to Hezbollah or relative to other operations in, uh, in Africa specifically? Well, I think it's very difficult because I think as we've all said, you have pipelines that will move almost any given product you put into it from one point to another, be it you know uh, human trafficking, drugs, weapons, or money moving either, either way. Um, and Hezbollah, particularly in West Africa, has perfected the art of bringing down all kinds of illicit stuff into the region to sell that would normally be illicit, but they move it in, in illicit fashions. Um, so I, I think our strategy has been largely fairly simplistic. I think we've been looking at uh, drug trafficking, terrorist sort of organized crime as different entities and not at, not at the overlap and interconnectedness of it. I think our presence on the ground in places like West Africa is so slim that we really have, we're really flying blind there. Uh, I think that our ability to and I, I put in, I say in my testimony, I think it, at the end of the day, our only real option, is we only have two things we can do, and policy or not only, but uh, two things primarily. One is to develop uh, vetted units that can work on the ground there with, with 
the Colombians, the Brazilians are also over there now, the United States, Britain. And the other thing is we have to get Europe to engage much more robustly because it's, one, it's their market that's being penetrated by the drugs, but two, they have the long history uh, and they know, I mean, I've dealt with the Belgians extensively on this, they know the, the Lebanese criminal networks very well, much better than we'll ever know. The French know the criminal networks that go into France, the British know the, and we have to get, and they're, yet they're, they also are viewing this in sort of piecemeal fashion, so we have to, we, the, the Europeans will have to engage in a much more robust fashion to look at how these groups overlap because they know these groups much better than we do and than we will in the next 20 years. Now, if I can um, add, uh, it is very important that we seek to prevent dangerous belligerent groups from penetrating illicit economies. And we have to ask ourselves in each case several questions. What illicit economies do they have accessible? Do they have accessible labor-intensive illicit economies? And this is especially where we should try to prevent them from accessing. Because if they do so, they get much more than money. They get support from the population. This has not yet happened in the case of West Africa, where the trade is mainly traffic, not labor-intensive. It's not cultivation. And we should make an effort to see that cultivation doesn't relocate there, for example. The second question we need to ask, if our goal is to dry up the money by targeting the illicit economy, is that likely going to switch the uh, belligerent group to try to develop another illicit economy or penetrate another illicit economy that might be ultimately even more harmful for our interest? Uh, the case of FARC is important. Um, while I do not believe that eradication uh, did decrease um, ultimately in the long term uh, financial resources of the FARC, although the FARC is beaten, I think it's largely irrespective or despite eradication, at least for a while we have seen uh, decreases in cultivation and limits on, on funding. And one of the likely, one of the resulting effects was that the FARC has tried to acquire uh, enriched uranium, or, or uranium, I should say, uh, as a way to resell and make money. This uh, is an illicit economy far more dangerous to the U.S. than the continuing cultivation of coca. And the third question we need to, take, uh, we need to ask in policy is, if we suppress uh, the illicit economy, where is it going to shift? If we suppress poppy in uh, Afghanistan, are we going to sell a wholesale transfer to Pakistan and going to set up even more dangerous problem for U.S. national security interests? Thank you very much. I want to thank all of our witnesses. very untimely to have these floor votes at this particular point. Uh, we don't have control over that, although I wish we did. Uh, I'm going to ask you this. The, the, Mr. Flake and others have hearings that if we were to go straight through, we'd be able to finish on that. But given the fact that these votes are going to take a half hour or more, maybe 45 minutes or an hour, uh, they've, other, they've got other classified briefings they have to go to. May we submit to you some questions that we didn't get to today and, and sure. uh, give you homework, if you don't mind, to submit back. I do want to explore uh, some of the priorities of some of these things. We've talked about strategies of reducing demand, of eradication of disruption in some areas, of in, in resolving uh, underlying economic factors and uh, governance and all those issues. I want to talk, is there a priority for that? Is something more important than another? I want to talk about Mr. Mansfield's look at what's the appropriate response to illicit drugs in Afghanistan when they think the government may be as involved as uh, other parties on that. The prospects of what's going on in Venezuela. Can we get Venezuela's cooperation with our country as opposed with FARC and, and others? Uh, what's happening in guinea Bissau uh, on that basis on that? How failed is that? Uh, the role of human intelligence. Uh, I know that's a serious matter. We're forming the same problems there in terms of language and, and other setbacks that we have in other areas. Uh, and how do we engage the international community? Uh, doctor, you mentioned India in some of your remarks. Why aren't they more engaged or are they more engaged? What's the role there? The Belgians and others. So with your permission, we will submit those records and ask for uh, any other comments you want to make on what we ought to be doing on that. As I said, we have another hearing coming up with uh, government agency witnesses and we'd love to be able to have that information uh, to get their response to it. Can I just say thank you for, uh, for coming in and uh, for giving us your expertise and, and taking your time and energy as well to do that, and we appreciate it a great deal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.
It's exciting, it's fun, and I enjoy myself. I never thought I would enjoy myself learning another language. Learning a new language really can be fun and easy. And to prove it, we'll send you our amazing demo CD absolutely free when you call. It helps me do something I really want to do, which is to know another language. It really works, because you can do as much as you want, anytime, anywhere. So give us a call or visit our website and see for yourself just how fast and easy you can learn a new language with Rosetta Stone. The fastest way to learn a new language, guaranteed. An all-new season of Dirty Jobs starts Tuesday at 9. It's all new on Discovery.